Hi, it's Jamie, progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie, it's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony, but you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, this is pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 332. Good things happen to those who hustle. Anis Nin. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Industry Jump. Industry Jump is a global community of verified filmmakers providing the next generation of filmmakers with the resources required to grow their businesses, learn new skills, and manage their careers. You can sign up for free. You can even create a verified portfolio, search for film crew to hire for your next projects, and learn from top-tier creators in the industry through live video mentoring. So if you want to check this out, guys, head over to industryjump.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Shotlister. Paper shot lists suck. And when something inevitably goes wrong on set, you're left to scribble all over your perfect plan. But with Shotlister, you can schedule your film shot by shot and minute by minute. Then on set, just update your shot list and Shotlister automatically does the math so you know exactly what you're doing. Check out Shotlister.com, which is available on macOS, iOS, and Android. And as a special bonus, Shotlister is giving away 50 free downloads every month. Just email IndieFilmHustle at Shotlister.com for your free copy. Before we get going, I want to thank everybody who came out yesterday and liked, subscribed, gave me uh, reviews, shared everything about Film Entrepreneur, man. Thank you guys so, so much. The, the love and support was Endless and extremely humbling. I am so glad you guys love what I've done with Film Entrepreneur and what I'm going to be doing with Film Entrepreneur moving forward. So thank you guys so much. And again, if you are listening to this podcast and you have not subscribed yet to Film Entrepreneur's podcast, please head over to filmbizpodcast.com. That's filmbizpodcast.com. Subscribe and leave a review. Put a five star review. Leave a review if you want to as well. It really helps us out a lot. We're already up to, I think, 16 reviews uh, within a 24 hour period, which is insane. So I really, really appreciate it. So please do as much as you can to help and support the new brand, the new company. We're all part of the same tribe Indie Film Hustle Tribe, Film Entrepreneur Tribe. We're all part of the same tribe. But thank you guys again so, so, so much. Today on the show, we have Andrew Quirkcheck, who is going to be talking about AI in the world of cinema and how AI is possibly going to take over the screenwriting process. I don't know. We're going to talk about it. He is the co-founder of NQ, a production company behind the indie films Cop Car, which was a big hit in the box office, and Print the Legend. Now, when Andrew co-founded NQ, he kind of saw that there was a really tough time for new filmmakers to break into the business and kind of like rise above all the noise. So his approach was very unique. He joined forces with a Silicon Valley venture capitalist to build NQ like a tech startup via a bi-coastal incubator model where directors could cut their teeth and build their portfolios doing commercial work. One of his alumni is John Watts, who directed the award-winning film Cop Car before he headed over to direct the small little Marvel movie called Spider-Man Homecoming. And then again, he figured out that there was more pain points for young producers. So at NQ, he actually sprouted groundbreaking AI technology to save time during the screenwriting process. Andrew's a fascinating guy, and it was a great, great conversation. So I want to dig into this because AI has been the news of, you know, we've seen AI cut a trailer AI write a screenplay, edit together movies. Like, it's it's a thing, guys. I know for us right now thinking, oh, AI will never take over the creative process. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We're in the infancy of this 
new technology. So I wanted to see how it really affects not only filmmakers, but indie filmmakers moving forward. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Andrew Korkchak. I'd like to welcome to the show, Andrew Korkchak. How you doing, brother? Good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So first off, man, how did you get into the film business? I got into the film business based on, um, I don't know, childhood love of, of film uh, and, you know, slowly building towards um, making myself an invaluable part of the process or at least striving to be one. Um, that's kind of, you know, it, it's been a long path, but um, I've had a great time doing it. Very cool. Now, you also went to USC, right? I did, Yes. That's where I've things had, really got kind of kicked into gear. Yeah. How did you, uh, how was your USC experience? I've, I've spoken to USC many times and I know a lot of USC grads. So I've heard, you know, many different uh, experiences outside of a USC, <laughs> out of the bubble of USC. Can you tell us what that experience was like and how it was for you? Sure. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I, um, I also timed things quite well in that I got to take advantage of the new, um, facilities, mm -hmm. um, donated, you know, graciously donated by George Lucas and several others. <laughs> um, so it was always nice, you know, walking into something that felt like a real film studio as a, as a, uh, 18 year old. But, um, you know, I can only speak from my own personal experience. I was a little bit of an odd bird there because I um, was very, very focused on animation and documentary work at the time. And I think USC has a reputation for developing great um, studio filmmakers, studio executives, and representatives. Mm -hmm. And I um, personally struggled a little bit with having to wear every hat. Um, and, you know, I, by then I knew I'd um, was not interested in directing personally, but you know, you have to go through the process and I do absolutely see the value in that. Now, did you, you, uh, when you got out of school, you had your first internship at Pixar, if I'm not mistaken, right? I actually, I took some time off of school to go do that. Um, even, even that better was back in 2010. <laughs> exactly. Even better. I was, I used to just, I used to jump off and go to universal studios and do my internships there and not go to class. <laughs> Do you, do you find it so invaluable to learn? You learn so much more doing internships and feel so much than you do in, in film school sometimes. Absolutely. And that's how I would kind of sum up film school. I mean, there's absolute value in going. And I think, you know, across the board, I've worked with talented people who have gone to a variety of different schools, some more liberal arts focused, um, you know, others that are these kind of, you know, classic, you know, film schools like NYU, UCLA or, um, USC, but really, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head that the, um, the, the best way to get you know, your hands on material and kind of see how, um, things are done in the real world is, is to get these kind of early internship experiences. Now, what was it like working at Pixar? I've never had the pleasure of walking into that magical factory that I've seen so many times on behind the scene videos. What is it like working there? It was a um, life changing and semi somewhat scary <laughs> experience. Uh, my first day, I don't think I'd ever filled out a W nine before. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, I think I claimed ninety nine dependents or something insane like that. So um, they obviously could tell I wasn't very good at paperwork back then. But I, you know, I was so fortunate in that I had known uh, Corey Ray and Darla Anderson, two amazing producers there, and. They had, um, you know, kind of slowly mentored me as I, you know, come out of high school and, um, you know, specifically, you know, decided to focus on, um, on animation. And I was there the summer they were releasing Toy Story 3. Mm -hmm. So I walked in and was greeted by a, I would say, 40 foot tall um, life size recreation of Ken's dream house with Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> Into and all the costumes, and then um, I can't remember the name of the ba the uh, pink bear, but he oh, did yeah, smell strawberries and was about eight feet tall and imposing. So um, it was, you know, that was that made a major impression on me. And I'd obviously grown up, you know, on their movies. I'd also been the same age as Andy in every Toy Story movie, Toy Story movie as they had been released. So mm -hmm. um, it felt personal. But I was lucky enough to get to work on. Monsters University, which was in its early stages uh, at that point. And what is the process like? It, I mean, and I, I've heard the stories of how they actually go through 
the process of making these films that it takes years and years and years of like development and there are different floors that you can't get to and <laughs> certain things like that, depending on where all the cool ideas are at. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it, it is, you know, it is fairly segmented in a way. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a great alleyway of animators who mm-hmm. based on the, you know, breadth of work that they're asked to do, you know, on a daily basis, they are, um, you know, allowed to build out their offices in whatever way, um, they desire. I mean, I saw hidden whiskey rooms and tiki bars and <laughs> it wasn't all, you know, drinking establishments, but, you know, all kinds of different, you know, cool stuff to kind of make it personal because, you know, uh, that's, it, they're the best of the best and it's a demanding environment. You know, I, um, I was very fortunate in that uh, the folks who were in charge of um, my time at Pixar, you know, very graciously understood that, you know, if I wasn't able to be a value add on the day um, on Monsters University, just based on, you know, kind of where the story reels were at, Mm -hmm. um, they would allow me to go, you know, sit in and take notes on, you know, other meetings. So seeing, you know, story um, and shot finally meetings for Cars 2 Brave was in production at the time. It was just an amazing time to be there and really, um, you know, uh, it was just, uh, as I said before, a deeply formative experience in terms of, you know, um, what I was able to, you know, kind of grab from it. Now, what was the biggest lesson you learned from working there? I think st- that story is king and mm-hmm. um, also just solving problems on paper. I think, you know, and the last thing I would add is, you know, having patience. I think as you alluded to, these, these movies do take a long time and they have a whole process and, you know, they do have it down to a bit of a science, but I think at the same time, um, you know, allowing stories to ebb and flow and breathe and get different opinions and take it through the brain trust process. You Mm -hmm. know, I think, um, all of those things work in conjunction to, you know, support, uh, the filmmaker's voice there and also keep it, you know, a democratic process within reason. And, um, certainly just having patience, especially as a develop, you know, kind of a producer who works most heavily in development was just, uh, it took me a couple of years to realize it, but I think just having patience for letting something, you know, kind of slowly unfurl without, um, pressuring the process or different stakeholders was, was hugely formative for me. Now, what is NQ? NQ is a film production firm based in Culver City. Um, we harness all kinds. I'm from Silicon Valley originally, so mm-hmm. I definitely grew up, you know, in and around the tech scene. And so, um, you know, as I alluded to before, we work most often in the development space. I love, you know, touching material as, as early as I can, whether it's finding books, you know, pre-release galleys articles from years ago, you know, kind of uh, things that have been picked over by others, you know, um, we just love, you know, getting our hands on material and either placing it with filmmakers or working to help shape it, you know, in support of, you know, a filmmaker's vision. Um, and you know, while in that process, you know, we've built several tools driven by AI to, you know, support, filmmakers, you know, when they raise their hand or, you know, inform the process. And as I alluded to before, you know, solve problems on paper. Now, what are some of these uh, Silicon Valley principles that you bring that helped create NQ and makes it a little bit different than other production companies in town? I think having a more progressive and calm working atmosphere than some of the things <laughs> I was exposed to. I don't want to incriminate anybody, but you know, um, the story, the horror stories I've heard or experiences I had, you know, coming up in the business, I think, um, you know, one thing that's important to me is supporting folks, um, throughout the process, not just hiring the best of the best and, you know, compounding, you know, people on top of one another. I think, you know, I just like I enjoy working with young filmmakers. I like, you know, the opportunity to mentor my, you know, kind of young, um, colleagues as well and, you know, give them maybe more responsibility than they were expecting and, you know, kind of allow them to learn lessons on their own. So that's certainly one thing that I was exposed to, you know, just growing up in the era of Google and, 
I guess I, I shouldn't be talking about Facebook as a uh, as an <laughs> as a um, <laughs> reference point, but you know, um, Silicon Valley, especially during the tech bubble in early two thousands, was just a fascinating place to just to to grow up and to kind of kind of hear different opinions and how people from all around the world kind of came together to you know build these you know tools that had the um, had the possibility of, you know, kind of really changing the landscape of the planet and how people interact with one another. So, I mean, I tried to <laughs> distill that down in my own way whilst running a, you know, kind of lean and mean production company. Now, when you are hiring people or bringing people in, what are you looking for as part of a team building situation? Because, you know, from my understanding of Silicon Valley principles, from what I've studied, it is quite different than your general old school production company here where like you were just saying, you just kind of like build up this kind of like either competitive situation or there's like, you know, the hierarchies. It's not as, as not as a, it's very much like the, what um, Pixar did with the brain trust. Like that concept was completely alien to anything, anybody here in, in, in Hollywood before it became popular, before they popularized it. So who are you looking for and what kind of, parts are you looking for when building a team? Because I think that's important for the audience to kind of understand when they're hiring crew. Uh, it's not always the most talented. It's not only the most experienced and, and the biggest star uh, that you want to hire, if, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, several of the things I really look for are obviously passion and energy. Um, and then I also put a, you know, huge emphasis on, um, creative taste. I, um, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, working with, you know, different filmmakers and, you know, directors, writers, other producers, et cetera, you know, um, at the end of the day, I think all people really have is their taste. Um, <laughs> experience is one thing, but every movie is a different beast as you know. So mm -hmm. I, you know, you kind of learn on the fly. And that's, you know, I think what you were alluding to about, you know, getting, you know, hands on experience as an intern or PA, what have you. So I, you know, I do place a, you know, a big part of my interview process really is talking about movies and, and TV shows that people enjoy what they enjoy about them. And, you know, helping to understand, you know, kind of how that taste profile fits in to a company like NQ and also challenges, you know, uh, those that are already there. Now, can you tell me a little bit about the script writing AI that you created, that your company created, which I find fairly scary and fascinating both at the same time? <laughs> sure. It's not meant to be, it's not meant to be scary. So this actually <laughs> originated with a filmmaker uh, named Oscar Sharp, who had teamed up with a AI researcher named Ross Goodwin. Um, I was not involved in the early days of their, uh, you know, of, of them kind of philosophically, you know, putting this stuff together, but that resulted in a project called Sunspring, um, mm -hmm. that we submitted to the, I believe, London 48 hour film festival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I was kind of caught hook, line and sinker by them and their pitch, you know, in terms of getting involved and the opportunity to just shoot over a weekend and be done was also <laughs> very attractive. Um, so you know, it, that was a fascinating experience. We worked with Thomas Middleditch on it, who did an amazing job of kind of selling the technology, even though narratively it didn't, um, you know, make a ton of sense, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so from there, you know, it was clear that um, the response that I felt I would get and just person in terms of my personal philosophy, it was that um, replacing screenwriters was not something I was interested <laughs> in. Um, and that screenwriters are some of the you know people I enjoy working with most. And so we then you know took a step back and tried to figure out you know a way in which um, you know we were able to support folks and really you know arm them with tools that you know. Uh, as I said, aid their, aid their process, you know, kind of from script to screen. So, you know, whether it's, you know, helping with, you know, story breakdowns, um, giving, you know, some perspective and advice on structure, or at least tracking structural changes, um, especially for more complicated, you know, kind of, uh, structural, um, situations. Mm -hmm. I think that's been, you know, a very helpful tool. And specifically that's one where, you know, John Watts has been an amazing resource as a, you know, kind of, um, admitted structure nerd. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 
you know, selfishly for my purposes, um, one of the things that's been amazing, you know, in terms of harnessing AI has been um, specifically applying that technology to the budgeting and scheduling process, Mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, um, I am not a line producer. Um, I work with lots of amazing line producers who make my life far easier than it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, However, it is a process working with them and it, um, you know, scripts evolve, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I get sent a variety of different, you know, material where, you know, people are kind of ballparking numbers over the phone. And I've learned my lessons in the past about (laughs) backing into, you know, specific numbers. And so building a tool where I'm just at least able to kind of drag and drop a PDF and get a, um, you know, kind of budget top sheet just as a ballpark for my own internal purposes has been, has proven totally invaluable. So uh, stop right there. So you actually have an, you have a program that does that. Like literally you drop a screenplay on there and it will give you a, a rough estimate of what this thing's going to cost. We do. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> it's been a lot. And it's been a lot of fun to develop. I'm very fortunate to work with some incredibly smart, um, folks, um, mm-hmm. who, you know, took a major interest in, um, applying their problem solving skills from a totally different discipline and have, you know, attempted to kind of make my life easier. <laughs> and, and, is, and is this something uh, that's just internally used or do you actually have it out for sale or is that now it is, it's not, it's not for sale yet. We, um, you know, this, as I'm sure you've, you're aware, you know, this industry, especially from the studio level down is, is fairly tech averse. Yes. Um, Why is that? And, and, you know what? I, people are set in their ways, and I think mm-hmm. you know what I hear time and time again is that movies have been made the same way for a hundred plus years, and why change it now? So right. that's what Netflix um, said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think you know for now it's been the kind of thing that I've um, you know shared with friends and other wine producers, and, and again, we're very early days in this you know kind of stuff, and so I would kind of characterize this as, as an experimental software still, mm-hmm. but. Mm-hmm you know, still one that informs our process and that is just constantly, you know, fun to interact with. Now, where do you see AI playing a part in the film business moving forward? I'm going to likely get in trouble for saying this, but I would say that we are probably 20 years away from a convincing AI screenplay, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that would trick a normal audience. Um, That again, this this is my personal opinion. So, and also, you know, I don't want to subjugate writers (laughs) and I want to support them and, you know, give them more tools, you know, to kind of extend, you know, what folks like myself and, you know, my collaborators and colleagues are able to kind of, you know, help, help them do. So, you know, in terms of, you know, AI applications, I would say certainly, you know, in the budgeting and scheduling software, which is an art in and of itself, Mm-hmm. And, you know, talented ADs and line producers are just invaluable um, allies to have, you know, heading into, you know, differently sized movies or when you start to get out of your comfort zone. And I would also say, um, you know, other people have dabbled in this as well, but just using, um, you know, with all of this Siri and Alexa and Google Voice you know, technology that's being harnessed, you know, finding a way, one thing that I was interested in as well is, you know, building a kind of virtual table read. Um, So with the same drag and drop kind of software, allowing um, writers or directors to basically uh, be able to bring their script to life just in a, you know, kind of preliminary sense in advance of sharing it with other human beings in case they were, you know, um, too modest or unwilling to do so at that stage. I think, um, you know, just like a writer will often read things out loud as they're writing, um, inviting in, you know, the table read process, which is something that, you know, kind of permeates all other levels of filmmaking and certainly is, uh, you know, a mandate at many levels, um, I think it is something that is massively helpful in, you know, helping to, you know, kind of diagnose where a script is at and, and, and what could improve. Now, I have to ask you, because you made a very bold statement. I know you're going to get in trouble for it, but I just want to dig into it a little bit deeper with the 20 years in the script writing. How would AI, because I mean, I I have to, I want to get, I want to understand it from your point of view. I mean, I'm a writer, I mean, and I've worked with many writers and I've spoken to some of the biggest writers in in Hollywood. Their process is so organic, so 
you know, the algorithm in their mind, if you will, to create what they create comes from life experience, comes from so many different influences. How can an AI even come close to that? Or how would it just work in your opinion? Like how would an AI create? I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just curious on the process if, if there is an answer to that question. Uh, I absolutely hear where you're coming from. And that's, you know, that I, I would echo the same sentiment. I, <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, it is, I mean, it's an art form and it's one that no matter how many scripts you train an AI on, which is really, you know, the kind of foundation of the process as I, as I understand it, um, you know, it in many ways is still parroting things that right. it was fed. Mm -hmm. And we were able to harness that for Sunspring in a way that, you know, we had a fun sci-fi um, short film that emerged from training an AI on X-Files, Star Trek, and Star Wars scripts, <laughs> which was amazing, but you got a specific kind of movie out of it. Right. And Oh, that's so you know, scary for Hollywood. Can you imagine them just dumping in a whole bunch of Marvel movies and Star Wars movies and Pixar movies and like seeing what they could spit out the other end? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would hope that that movie would make an enormous amount of money because <laughs> otherwise, you know, why would you do it? But um, yeah, you know, I think that, you know, again, I mean, I think we're in agreement that, you know, uh, I'm most interested in, you know, tools that supplement and extend people's abilities rather mm -hmm. than replacing them. Yeah, and I think that's – I personally think that's where AI will come in into play, where it will make life a lot easier. But I think you know, even like on the budgeting and the scheduling side of things, it might give you a good head start on a process. But then you would need an, you know, a, 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 you know, a line producer to come in or a first AD to come in to kind of tweak it. Uh, but it might be able to give you a hell of a head start. Uh, would that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're seeing this every day in you know with companies like – Final Draft and Writer Duet, you know, every few months they're rolling out new, you know, feature sets, you know, that are additive to the process and do help organize things. And um, I think that's great. And so if those, if that's the easiest point of adoption for, you know, writers and directors, you know, to kind of find and discover this technology, that's, that's awesome. And, and in many ways, how it should be. Now, do you believe that, because I agree with you, the studio is so, the studios are so caught, stuck in their ways that it's extremely difficult for them, to, for them to even move an inch, let alone like, you know, when Netflix showed up, everyone was laughing at them. But then mm -hmm. they've literally become one of the biggest studios in town, uh, doing it in a completely different way and delivering content in a completely different way. Do you believe that a lot of this kind of technology or AI kind of uh, tech would make its way down more into the indie film world? more and more of these lower budget films where then it slowly will go up, up the ladder. I certainly hope so. I mean, um, you know, being a young guy myself, I hope that other, you know, kind of young and up and coming filmmakers I work with, you know, learn the value of these kind of tools, you know, in a way that is additive, um, and not a crutch and, you know, can, as you would allude, as you had alluded to, you know, really, um, kind of grow with this and, you know, when they are major forces of nature within the industry, you know, kind of make this a mandate as part of their process. So I think just interjecting as early as possible um, in whatever way is supportive. If somebody is interested in, in harnessing this kind of tech, um, you know, I think that's, that's always been our strategy in terms of, you know, adoption. Uh, do you see an AI directing a film? <laughs> You know, it's funny you mentioned, I saw, I, I believe, I can't, I can't remember what studio put it together, but there was a, a very interesting um, AI edited trailer about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was a little bit, you know, kind of rinse and repeat in a way, but it was still very cool to see a, a polished trailer for po popular consumption, you know, kind of cut by, I believe it may have been, you know, you harnessing IBM Watson technology, mm -hmm. you know. In terms of directing, um, again, there's so many points of stimuli mm -hmm. and parts of the directing process, as you know, that are just meant to be, you know, kind of gut decisions, you know, right. that, right. it's you art. know, come up on a, on a um, you know, moment to moment basis that, 
you know, I have to admit a computer may be a faster decision maker than, you know, a human being, Mm -hmm. but I can't say it will be as informed, you know, keeping and keeping track of, you know, uh, the artistic goal, you know, dealing with personnel, um, continuing a vision for, you know, for a project or Mm -hmm. specific scene. That's a lot of different stuff to be juggling. And so I, I hope that it's something that develops, but, um, I, I remain skeptical for the time being. Now, and I'm, I'm just going to get a little sci-fi here, but wouldn't it be amazing that in the, in, I don't know when, but at a moment in time where you can literally download your mind to an AI or a computer in the whole consciousness, could you imagine like downloading James Cameron and Steven Spielberg and Chris Nolan eventually where their, their, their creative essence continues in a non-traditional or non-organic way. Again, I'm going very sci-fi here. Wouldn't that be an insane thing? Because wouldn't it be cool to see what Hitchcock would be doing today with this technology or Kubrick doing in today's technology? You know, it, what do you, I'm just curious what your thoughts about that is. Again, going super sci-fi. <laughs> I think that could be cool. I mean, you know, it's like an AI extension of Masterclass, you know, um, really <laughs> right. getting into the mind of, you know, kind of a, you know, a enormously, you know, talented and, and, uh, you know, special, you know, kind of group of filmmakers. I mean, I could, I could see that being a very cool, you know, thing, just as long as it doesn't, you know, create a ceiling for other filmmakers in terms of, you know, how they want to innovate and, um, you know, build their own art form. Now, do you think filmmakers today need to be entrepreneurs in the film business, especially independent filmmakers? I think I think there's certainly aspects of entrepreneurship that are important. Um, I think just self advocacy is one of the most important things, and that took me personally a little time to you know understand. And then mm-hmm. you know everyone had to start somewhere. I remember someone taking me aside and just saying, "Stop, you know, acting like you're this is your first rodeo, or stop telling people that." You know, like everyone mm-hmm. has a rookie season, and you know you have to build from there. Like everyone started not having any idea what they're doing, mm-hmm. so. I think, you know, finding a balance between, you know, self-confidence and, you know, also, um, you know, uh, humility um, in terms of, you know, being open to learning the process from people more experienced than you and kind of taking their lessons and, and, and making it work for yourself personally, I think is um, is important. But, you know, in terms of, you know, classic entrepreneurship, you know, I think, you know, building some sort of presence and um, bringing groups of people together in a way um, is is likely the most important thing, I think, in terms of, you know, making your, you know, staking your claim and, you know, kind of making your first steps in the industry. It's really important to have a group. And and can you talk a little bit about the emphasis of marketing and branding? Because I think that kind of leads into what you – or it kind of takes one you just said as far as self-advocacy is that b- branding yourself and, and understanding marketing and, and that aspect of things, which they don't teach you in film school, but it's mm-hmm. so important in today's world, especially in today's world of social media and, and also just rising above the noise. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I would say that, you know, it's important to be honest with yourself in terms of the the kind of movie you're interested in making, um, especially in your first couple hits at bat. I would also say, um, yeah, I mean, I would extend that to just say general self-awareness, you know, and, <laughs> you know, people, you know, people put a lot of emphasis on log lines for writers, all this kind of stuff. I think as a young director or writer director, you know, you should have, you know, um, instant recall um, as if it's an elevator pitch of, you know, the, the kind of movies and tones that you want to be exploring. Um, I think that makes a huge, that makes a huge impact and, um, shows me that, you know, just as a, as a producer, you know, that, you know, somebody has really thought, um, a couple of steps ahead of the process and, you know, simultaneously as a, as a producer, you know, one of the things that became clear to me, um, when I you know entered the industry, which was around the same time that you know Netflix started buying original content and mm-hmm. creating it themselves, was that producers in today's world and really any stakeholder, you have to be able to see the movie poster in your head from the earliest stages of the script. 
Um, and I don't mean that cynically and that you, you know, what actor and, you know, all, <laughs> yeah, right. color and all this stuff, but you have to know what kind of movie you're making and why you're making it, why it's personal to you and important to be shared with an audience. And is it just an, you know, exercise for, you know, one's own ego and, you know, um, really trying to, this goes back to kind of solving things on paper. I mean, I think just building a game plan, um, from a 30,000 foot view in terms of what you're trying to accomplish and why, um, I think that all plays into, you know, a level of, that may not be classic entrepreneurship, but that it gives the air of, you know, <laughs> being an entrepreneur, I believe. Now, how do you choose your projects to produce? Great question. Um, you know, some things come up organically from material that I've read or that colleagues have read and wanted to bring, you know, inside the company and, and we will place it with a filmmaker, um, that we like. You know, other things are brought to us by by folks that, you know, have made movies that we're fans of. You know, occasionally, um, you know, we find amazing material through, you know, different outlets, whether it's, you know, short of the week, Vimeo staff picks, stuff that's graduated from the Sundance Labs, the Blacklist, you know, all those kind of tools. We really try to keep our ear to the ground, especially at the level that we're working in terms of discovering new talent there. And, you know, also the odd pitch, you know, we're, we're, we're totally open to, you know, kind of hearing pitches and, um, you know, just kind of reacting to people's excitement and then finding a way to, you know, support them. And you worked with John Watts, right? On the, the director of Spider-Man. I did. Yeah. I made, I made top car with him. So that was his first film, right? And then it was actually his second. Um, he had made a great, great movie up in Canada called clown. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of the idiosyncrasies of the distribution process, actually clown was released after <laughs> cop car. Um, of so course. in John, I was very, I mean, I was incredibly spoiled as he's an amazingly talented guy and just a, a nice person to boot. Mm -hmm. Um, in that, you know, I was very spoiled in that he had gotten his first time director jitters, um, which manifest themselves in a variety of different ways with people. Um, but he had really, he knew exactly what kind of movie he was trying to make. It was incredibly lean. Um, we had about a 15 person crew. Um, and you know, it, it was a very fast moving train that I was very fortunate to, to jump on because, you know, it opened up a, you know, uh, enormous, um, network of collaborators that I, you know, continue to work with to this day. And, and you also had Kevin Bacon in that, if I'm not mistaken. We did, yes. And the, the, the Kevin exactly. Bacon. The yes, Kevin I'm Bacon. only yeah, I'm I'm one degree, zero degrees. I'm I, I do know <laughs> Kevin Bacon. He was enormously talented. So um I mean just the guy could not have been nicer or more humble. And you know, I would also say, you know, Cameron Mannheim and and Shay Wiggum in addition to the boys. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was just a very tight knit, you know, community and uh, I'm just I, uh, it's been really fun seeing all the cool stuff that Shay's been doing these days. Um, I yeah. loved seeing him in homecoming and, um, yeah, Kevin's been working with a couple of my other collaborators on a, on a new showtime show. Now, where do you see independent film going in your, from your perspective? You know, it's, it's hard. It's obviously hard to guess. No, <laughs> I, of course I would say, um, you know, as I've, as I've grown up a little bit, it's easy to get discouraged by, you know, kind of people who are tracking various film markets. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of you know, independent film is, is obviously, you know, driven by, you know, that process. Um, it's, it's weird because, you know, as I was come, one thing I did wasn't taught in film school that would have been helpful, um, was, you know, the process of foreign sales mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that, I was entering, you know, in about 2013, I was entering the industry at a time where that was, you know, was still a very foreign sales driven indie process. And, mm -hmm. you know, folks like Kevin Bacon got movies like Cop Car Made. And, um, you know, just like any experience, if you don't, you know, be honest about what you don't know, and <laughs> somebody will hopefully explain it to you or just hang up. And um, I would say, you know, I've cautiously watched as companies have kind of moved away from foreign sales where, you know, actor value isn't the first part of the conversation. It, it never really sat well with me, you know, as a producer, you know, as somebody who's kind of putting all the pieces together 
you know, that a director would be forced to work with an actor because of some perceived value in Azerbaijan. Mm-hmm. But this is <laughs> this is the business I chose to work in. So, <laughs> you know, anyway, I, I, I mentioned this because things are obviously evolving and we have, you know, many of my friends who are traveling to Cannes right now and likely selling foreign on some of their movies. So best of luck. But I, you know, that's a definite turn. And I would also say from the, the way that some of these streaming companies a- approach um, acquiring finished films in, you know, their preference for worldwide deals, you know, creates a little bit more, um, of a complicated situation. If a producer has kind of syndicated out, you know, some level of foreign sales, you know, they often have to kind of unwind some of those deals, you know, so, or, you know, carve out, you know, specific territories that ultimately, um, you know, affect the, you know, the sale price of the movie. But, you know, this is, that's all very cynical, um, (laughs) stuff. I would say, you know, in terms of indie film, it's, this is an amazing time to be kind of breaking into the industry because there's, I think, uh, you know, information has been democratized in such a way that, you know, um, you know, you're able to learn, (laughs) <laughs> how to make a movie basically from YouTube and mm-hmm. with resources like you run and, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of, you know, perspective that you share, you know, so I think, you know, gone are the days of, you know, people like James Cameron going to the USC library and reading every book on filmmaking. I think you can kind of, you have everything at your fingertips and, you know, you have the ability to kind of create or join a community, you know, of people, um, who, you know, want to support each other and are able to do so because I mean, at the end of the day, this is a team sport. Um, you know, despite, you know, the many ways, the many organic ways that that, that projects began. So kind of a roundabout answer, honestly, Mm -hmm. but you know, I, I remain very excited about the independent film space and, you know, I think, um, there's more buyers than ever as well. So that will, that will drive. I think that's a good thing for everybody. And everyone has a different mandate. Everyone has a different level of reach and a different platform for getting to their audience. And I think just having flexibility in terms of, you know, knowing where some of these movies, if they may be quote unquote less commercial or, you know, more art house, what, what have you, you know, um, having outlets, you know, so these movies can be seen, um, in a way or shared in a way other than word of mouth (laughs) is, is good for everybody. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Watch a ton of movies. And if you like the movie, watch it again. And then maybe one more time. Um, really try to crawl into mater- inside material you, you enjoy. Um, I would say make as many short films as you can. Um, you know, Try to work in the commercial space if you're struggling to pay the bills. Um, or if you want to, you know, all this stuff, every, pro- every piece of the process in filmmaking seems to, you know, occurs to me to be a, you know, kind of like flexing a muscle. So why not, you know, exercise it? Um, and, you know, I would, as I had alluded to before, I think, you know, over the years I've learned just the value of having, you know, a network and community and it's okay to come to LA or New York or wherever you live, um, and not know anybody. Um, that's what the internet is for. That's what, you know, going to the movies is about, you know, I think trying to find people who are interested in telling similar stories to you or wildly different, it will inform your process and allow you to support one another. Can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oof. Um, well, I'm biased. I mean, Ed Catmull's creativity oh, love that was book. a bit of a Bible to me. Um, mm-hmm. that is a great read. Um, I would say, uh, the Savage Detectives by Roberto Bolaño made a mm-hmm. major impression on me. I re- I tend to read almost everything that New York Review of Books puts out. I mean, all of these things kind of inform my process and I always, I make a point, you know, despite the fact that a lot of my day is taken up reading, um, which mm-hmm. I enjoy and it's kind of integral to my being, um, I mm-hmm. would say I do make a point to also read for pleasure and not only read things that, you know, can easily be set up as movies, which is a hole that I've seen <laughs> several of my friends fall into. <laughs> right. You can't just can't just uh, read a, mo- a book anymore without thinking, oh, can I option this? 
yeah, or feeling like it's a waste of time if you continue. You know, I think I, I try to just put that, you know, take that hat off for a second, and just enjoy something, especially if it's a different discipline than I'm, uh, you know, aware of already. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, I would say, you know, it, it's back to, you know, the value of, uh, of a network. Um, one of my, one of my criticisms with USC, um, and this may have been just what I took from it, mm -hmm. um, or I maybe missed that day of class was, you know, the importance of building a network. And that's kind of the point of going to film school in a way is mm -hmm. you can, you know, as, as you had said earlier, you can kind of learn many of these lessons in a, you know, um, equally stressful environment professionally where you're being paid to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I would say, you know, it was really the, it was really the process of making cop car where I got to see folks like Chris Ford and John Watts work together, you know, Andrew Hassey, who, you know, co-edited the film all these guys had known each other since freshman year of college at NYU and had kind of stuck together. And they're part of an amazing um, collective of filmmakers called Waverly. Mm -hmm. um, that includes Duncan Skiles and Ben Dickinson and Jake Schreier, among others. And, you know, that was a really sobering lesson because I basically, um, you know, I started NQ while I was in my, you know, last year of college. And, um, you know, because of my interests, you know, in animation and documentary work, as I had, uh, you know, outlined before, I didn't necessarily find my tribe at USC. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I was lucky in that I lived in LA for a little while. I had some, you know, I had a few random personal connections to people who seemed to know what they were doing. But um, really, I think the importance of, you know, surrounding yourself with great people, people you want to collaborate with, people who have approached things differently than you and who can really challenge your material. Mm -hmm. Often it's my closest friends who give the harshest notes and that there's a time and place for that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, I, think I can't stress that stuff enough. And I just have, you know, complete, totally selfishly benefited from, you know, um, falling in with these groups of, you know, talented filmmakers who take care of one another, you know, just like our sister company, Green Card Pictures in New York. Now, what is the biggest fear you had to overcome in making your first few films? I think being exposed to somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that became clear after a little while was that no one really knew what they were doing. Amen. And, um, <laughs> that that's part of a process. And one of the things that I've definitely articulated, you know, to other folks I've spoken to in the past is that, you know, for the first couple of years, I was waking up sick to my stomach every single day. And I was afraid of virtually every <laughs> different situation the first time I went through it. Mm -hmm. And that feels natural, you know, and I think that was a symptom of, you know, uh, pushing myself, you know, very, very hard and kind of jumping in with both feet. Um, so I would say, you know, being exposed to somebody who didn't know what they were doing or, you know, making a mistake and, you know, holding up the process or making things more difficult for other people. Um, that doesn't really feel like it's in the job description for a producer. And so I was constantly, you know, worried about, um, you know, causing unintended consequences, but you, you learn to, you know, get over that and, and, you know, own your process. And three of your favorite films of all time. Apocalypse Now, definitely number one. Mm -hmm. um, good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Mm, good choice. And then maybe a tie between Clueless and, um, let's see, Night Train to Munich. You know, that's, you know out, of, out of all four of those, one of those films doesn't belong with the others. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard. I've, I've, I've got over 300 and odd number <laughs> interviews here, and I've asked that question. I've never heard Apocalypse Now, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and Clueless all in the same grouping. Uh, and Clueless I personally enjoy and love, but I've just never heard that combination. So very, very interesting combo. <laughs> good, good. Now, where can people find uh, where can people find you and, and more information about what you're doing? On our website, nq.com. Um, in addition, you know, there's other I, I alluded to them before, but greencardnewyork.com also has some resources um, and information about some of the filmmakers that we work with and support in the commercial production space, which, as I said before, is an amazing way to make a living and 
you know, learn the different, you know, processes that go into, you know, making, you know, movies, commercials, shorts, TV shows, all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do not have a large social media presence, so you'll have to dig to find me. Okay. Um, I am on the screenwriting Reddit, so um, I will hopefully pop in and out with some hopefully helpful advice from time to time. Yes. Um, and you know, otherwise, you know, I think using the contact form on our website to um, you know to reach out, I think, is always a helpful you know way to get in touch. Uh, Andrew, man, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an eye-opening experience talking to you about technology and about your perspective on the business. So, thank you for dropping some knowledge bombs on the tribe today. No, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So what did we learn today? That we should all just forget about being in the film business and forget about writing screenplays because AI is going to take over. I mean, obviously. <laughs> well, guys, I mean, it was a great... First of all, I want to thank Andrew for coming on the show and and helping us go into a deep dive into AI and what it can actually do for this business. Now, I think there is a place for AI. I think there is going to be a place for AI in multiple industries around the world. And I don't think the film industry is going to be much different. There's going to be ways that AI is going to be incorporated into our industry and into our business, into our day-to-day life as filmmakers and screenwriters for that matter. It, It will happen. I mean, it is happening in many ways today. So just keep an eye out. It's always good to Keep your ear to the grindstone to see what's coming around the corner because that's where the opportunities lie. That's where, you know, people who are afraid of new technology, people who want to stick to the old way of doing things, they're the ones that get left behind. The first people on YouTube, the first people to shoot with a red camera, the first people to edit digitally as opposed to on on a flatbed, the first people to go on a streaming service and start releasing their film streaming. All of these innovators, the ones that jump out front of things, they're the ones that take over the industry and they're the big boys or big girls or the big dogs in that space. And that's what you always got to look for. You don't look at what's going on now. You look at what's coming around the corner and try to anticipate as much as you can to jump in on a new platform, a new technology before anybody else does. Sometimes it pops, sometimes it doesn't. But I truly do believe that AI will have a place in our business in a very significant place in the years to come. Now, if you guys live in the LA area, tomorrow, July 18th at 7 p.m. at The Parlor, I will be doing a QA and a at the ISA Network event. It's already a packed house already from what I hear. They've sold over 100 tickets already, which is great. So I'm hoping a lot of people will show up. So I will be there and I will put links to, I'll put the address and links to that event in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 332. I hope to see you guys out there. And if you haven't already, please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com. Leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to the show. It really helps us out a lot. It really does. So thank you for listening. That's the end of another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Pros do it right to take their business to the next level by relying on trusted brands to get the job done. Lowe's is here to help and help you save. For your next stain job, get a gallon of Valspar One Coat Transparent Stain Plus Sealer starting at $35.98. And we now offer the Little Giant King Combo Ladder, the world's first step, extension, and leaning ladder, giving you the flexibility to do just about any job for only $159. For trusted brands that make the job easier, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's, U.S. only. When one thinks of the deli, the sunny shores of Waikiki don't typically come to mind. But Boar's Head is anything but typical. Introducing our new bold Aloha Sunshine Turkey. Sweet, savory, and dare we say, tropical. Coated in a savory pineapple-flavored glaze, it's a taste of Polynesian paradise right at your deli. Bon appétit, bon voyage, and of course, aloha. Bold aloha sunshine turkey. Available fresh from the deli and only from Boar's Head. Compromise elsewhere.